Hey everybody, it's Nathan Cool with Swellwatch on surfingmagazine.com. Get a lot of questions about forecasting and what some of the terms mean, how is it actually done. I wanted today to give a small primer on this. Uh, a couple times a year I go down to Loyola, Mar excuse me, Loyola Marymount University down in Los Angeles and I address the environmental sciences class. It's usually on two topics. One is uh, climate change, the other is surf forecasting. And uh, it's not as hard as you may think to actually do this. It's really a lot of persistence. There's a little bit of science behind it and what drives it, but the calculations for judging when surf is going to arrive isn't really all that difficult. <clears throat> I can remember back in 1996, actually, a, uh, a leader in surf forecasting, and I was actually uh, starting surf forecasting commercially back in those days, uh, had contacted me and, uh, and said that, oh, you'd be getting our proprietary information, be careful, we'd be sending out, and, you know. So I got a nasty gram from him and threatened to be sued if I ever crossed the line. Um, and it actually motivated me all the more to, to actually get into surf forecasting, because the fact is, it's really not that hard. I have mostly an engineering background. It wasn't that hard to, you get a few formulas, you plug them in. I wrote a book on how to do this. It's called the Wet Sand Wave Cast guide to surf forecasting and it shows the basics of how to do this um, with just plugging in a few simple calculations having the persistence to do this frequently and never give up on it that's actually the key to it um, when you calculate surf you might be looking at a swell that's seven days away if you want to know what's happening this weekend and it's Thursday it's too late you should have already been looking at this a week ago and that's where I come in so I've been doing this since 1996 and of course now working for a surfing magazine doing this I've got a lot more time to actually give you then the information on how this is done so anyways I wanted to show this presentation I'll follow up some more with some other videos and of course there's a lot of other videos to come still on other stuff happening this year with El Nino but without further ado Let's take a look at the surf forecasting primer. So this is it here. This is basically the presentation that I, I give every couple times a year. If you ever, this is similar to the one that I also gave at Scripps uh, for the Groundswell Society some years ago. So you may have seen quite a bit of this. Basically, what this talks about is a point in time where everything changed and how we do surf forecasting today and the basics of it. And I like to use 1963 as that point of reference because that's also when I was born. But it's also a very important year that something was discovered. A lot of things were going on that year, but the most important thing that for me as a surf forecaster that I didn't see uh, coming, <laughs> nobody really saw, was that, uh, and it stayed pretty silent, was that a man by the name of Walter Monk, down here in the bottom right, who still works for Scripps Institute of Oceanography in his 90s, and this is him in his younger days, back in 1963, he actually discovered something that changed the world. He is the father of forecasting. It's not any of the commercial guys that are out there doing it or who may have passed away over the years. It was Walter Monk. He made a discovery. And there's a YouTube video out there. I encourage you to find this on YouTube. It's called Waves Across the Pacific. He showed in 1963 what we sometimes call the pebble in the pond. <clears throat> if you were to think about a pond of water um, and you throw a pebble into it, ripples go out in all directions. Eventually they reach the shore. They may be weak. What Walter Monk did in 1963, he got the funding and spent that summer proving that a storm in Antarctica could send waves the entire length of the Pacific reaching the shores of Alaska. And from that now we have all kinds of science and calculations to use to be able to track those storms. One of the things that I use the most, and a lot of forecasters that do this manually do, is that we use these things called WAMs, wave analysis models. In this one, a lot of information, you can pause the video if you want to see the different keys on this. I'll run through this very quickly, though the most important thing are the wave heights. We can see a large storm, in this case, down near New Zealand. And that has about 35, 36 foot seas in its center. Very large storm and something that large, that far away, will send Southern Hemi Swell to Southern California. We know this also by tracking it over time because it's not just when something happens, it's the projection of what will happen. So models go out farther and farther and further in time. And you might see me say, you know, according to the 48H model or the 24H model, well that's hours. So a 48H model is 48 hours out, a 144H model is 144 hours out. The further out we go in time, the less accurate it becomes because it gets more and more of a, of a guesstimate. Uh, based on, and of course we're under chaos theory and when it comes to anything weather-wise, we don't know exactly what will happen, but we can get a pretty good idea. 
One of the keys in today's modern forecasting is, and it helps if you're a software engineer, um, is to be able to grab the data before it gets turned into a model. This data, I don't care what website you look at that does serve forecasting, whether it's the ones that sent me a nasty gram back in 1996, or whether it's anybody else, and I'll leave them all unnamed, but even who I work for, uh, for on Surfing Magazine, Swell Watch, they do the same thing, we all admit it. And um, this is from the data from the, mostly from the NCEP branch of NOAA. There are a couple other places to get it, but it's almost basically the same. It comes from your tax dollars that are gathering this information off of buoys and ships and whatnot and generated through supercomputers to make the models. But if you grab the middleman, you grab that data, then you can start parsing that out for all kinds of points across the planet. Once you do that, then you can start making charts and graphs and all kinds of things out of that and to judge what will happen over time and present it your own way. So you want to start a surf forecasting site, get a graphic artist, and then all you need is just a uh, somebody to grab the data and parse it for you, and the graphic artist will then make it pretty, give it something different, and a cool marketing name. That's why a lot of these surf forecasting sites look alike, but the key is, and I will admit, everybody does a slightly different calculation across the data. Not always, but sometimes, and I'm going to get into those calculations. First though, four steps to actually how this is all done. I'm not going to get into too much depth about the surf science. I might save that for another video, but there's four steps shown here. One, a low pressure system forms somewhere out in the ocean. In this case, we can see it out here, kind of uh, off the uh, Aleutian chain, very common area for Southern California. This red band in front of it actually is from a precipitation model. That's a uh, weather front. Anyways, from the low pressure, winds pick up, winds form. So now what's happening is we have wind energy going across this storm. That wind energy is going to start pumping itself into uh, this, the ocean. And when it does, it creates very large seas. And that's what we saw in our whams. One thing I did want to show, though, is something with the energy and how it travels. I'll show you a slideshow on this just real quick. So this shows the wave period energy. This is one of my models from wavecast.com that I generate uh, based once again off that same data uh, that everybody else grabs. This is the storm in question. This is the length of the period. The redder it gets, the longer those periods. So we move it forward in time. You can see, yeah, it's moving across the entire Pacific, just like Walter Monk said it would. Uh, but look, look what happens here. As we move it forward, we start seeing these purple bands starting to show up. Those purple bands, according to my key down here, those are extremely long periods. This is what's known as a forerunner. Uh, very long periods that are traveling and eventually outrun the other waves behind it. Longer periods travel faster, and that's key to our calculations. So let me move back here to our presentation. And <clears throat> We can take now all this information together. All we need to know is the distance that that uh, storm is from our coast, the angle, its trajectory, the wave heights, and the period. Everything just shown here. Once you have that, you can get it all off the WAMs, or you can automate it and get it off the you know other data. Uh, if you trust the automation, and it's not always that accurate, and I'll show you why with some of these calculations. The first thing, got to know where you are. This is one of the hardest parts. It may look very daunting and overwhelming. Once you have the formula, you can plug it into Excel or whatever you want, software-wise, but you have to realize that the Earth is round. So to calculate a distance across the curvature of the Earth, you have to use a formula such as this known as the Haversine. And uh, then you can get the distance in nautical miles. I also have a calculator on wavecast.com, which you can use to help out for all this. Once you have that, um, you can use these other models that are showing the world is flat, known as a Mercator projection, um, to calculate what's the angle from this storm, this fetch, to where I'm going to forecast, in this case, Southern California. So what's that angle? Also, what's the trajectory of that storm? How is it moving? If that storm were to move completely away from Southern California, there would be no energy. If it moves in a fraction toward it, then there's a portion. If it moves directly toward it, it gets all of it. Also then down here we can see the different angle. This is what I talk about when I say it's coming in from 180 degrees or 270. In this case, the angle for this swell right here, as I put here, it's approximately 285 degrees. The trajectory is approximately 20 degrees from Southern California. We know the wave heights. We know the periods by looking at them. Let's get on with the calculations. But first, there's two things we have to take into consideration and with these calculations is that there's going to be a wave decay. It's a non-linear function, meaning that uh, the wave energy does lose 
its energy. It does decay over distance, but not uh, equal. You can't just say that, okay, every 100 miles it loses so much energy. But if you plug this calculation, it's logarithmic, um, but you, or use this chart, which is also in my forecasting book, and you, there's also one here, a logarithmic uh, calculation you can plug into Excel. <clears throat> Excuse me, but once you have that, then you know how much decay factor to apply, apply based on the distance from that fetch to where you're forecasting. One other uh, thing of decay, and this is called the angular spreading decay. This is where if you were directly hit with the energy, you'd get 100% of it. There'd be no loss, a 0% loss. But if you're not directly there, then you're going to see a certain amount of other loss. Um, and once again, this is not exactly a linear formula, but to get kind of a linear calculation out of it, um, you can by using these approximations, which is just taking into consideration the angle and a little bit of math. And you get enough of an idea for forecasting surf that you can get within chest to head high or waist to chest high and, and those type of calculations. If you're needing to get down to the millimeters and inches, uh, you need to really do a lot more math than this. But we're not so concerned with that for surf forecasting. We can get within minutes, we can get within hours of arrival, and we can get within a, feet, a foot or two of what's actually going to happen. Um, so let's take those numbers. We just plug them all in. They're all here to the right. I won't go through all of them. But at the bottom, and you can pause this if you ever want to go back and see any of this, the bottom's interesting. So the height, we know that the height came out to a calculation of about seven feet, 6.8 feet. Uh, but that's the sea height. There's also a face height to take into consideration. Uh, and that's going to break differently based on uh, a lot of things about the break I'll show in the next slide. But most importantly, we've got the timing. And the timing came in because we knew the distance and the periods. The periods really uh, mean a lot on how fast it's going to travel. If you recall, the forerunners were, for instance, running faster and arriving first before everything else because they were such long periods. So the breaking wave face height, this is where it gets tricky and you gotta throw some kind of black magic in there a little bit until you actually know a lot. Uh, if you look at the diagram on the right, that's the bathymetry around a portion of Southern California. Um, and it's, you, know, you take the water away and you can see it's chaotic underneath of there. So a lot of things will happen when the wave energy starts approaching that. Basically what happens, the wave energy starts coming toward the shore. It, uh, the shore is shallower. The wave energy has been running underneath of the water this whole time from its thousands of miles typically away, like in the one we just saw. And when it starts reaching that shore, it has no place to go but up. And depending on, though, all the characteristics, the bathymetry of what we're looking at here will depend on what's going. As a rule of thumb, for my face height approximations, a lot of times I'll use just a tenth of the period. And you can see that down here where I show that the face height approximation for steep shoaling is the, the height, the h, that's actually those c heights we calculated, times the period times 0.1. So if this were the 20 second period, it would be twice as high. So 6.8 foot c's times those 20 second periods, and a tenth of that equals about a 13.6 foot face. I'd call that about double overhead. Okay, doing a south swell. Basically the same thing. It doesn't matter where this is. This could even be in a Great Lake. It could be in the, uh, the Atlantic. It could be in any ocean. The Pacific just happens to be the larger, and so we get very large swells that come out of it. They have a lot more time to grow, a lot of other dynamics. But it's the same thing. You just get those numbers, you plug them in, and you run the exact same calculations. And this is a primary example of that, where a southern hemi swell, very large. Uh, it took, though, a long time. You can see by the time, since it was 5,200 nautical miles away, and it only had 15 second periods, that it took about nine days to arrive. And when it did, it was about chest high when it, when it did arrive from that particular storm. And that is a surf forecasting primer. <laughs> it's only a portion of the lecture that I give down at LMU every year, uh, but hopefully that was enough to give you kind of an idea of what I write about in my surf forecast, how some of this is done, how you could also do this yourself. I plan on having more uh, videos, so get in more depth. If, if you'd be interested, you can also write to me and let me know, hey, this was interesting, or no, it wasn't, or I'd like to actually know more about something else, let me know. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel and uh, stay updated then on everything that's happening, not just with this type of information, but also following El Nino this year, any of the other major hurricanes that might form, and other information that could be surf worthy and you might enjoy. Uh, also, you can follow my surf forecasts on forecasts.surfingmagazine.com and feel free to follow me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Nathan Todd Cool. That's it for now. So until next time, take care. 
Be safe and smile in the lineup.